What is cracking, Hope Nation? I have something pretty special for you. Yes, you are about to watch the first part of my documentary film, Suicide the Ripple Effect, for free, right here on youtube.com slash Kevin Hines. This special full-length feature documentary film drops in its entirety on iTunes, May 30th, 2019. That's right, multiple best documentary of the year, award-winning and life-saving feature film can be pre-ordered today by clicking the link in the description below. It's only $4.99, and if you pre-order now through May 29th, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the beginning of Suicide, The Ripple Effect. Are you okay? Is something wrong? Or can I help you? Those were the words that I desperately wanted to hear as I stood atop the Golden Gate Bridge walkway, staring and leaning over the four foot nothing rail, peering down to the looming waters below. Right before, I catapulted myself over the rail. They would have people believe, even today, that 1,600 people died off this bridge. It's not true. For all the bodies washed away to sea, never to be found. For all the bodies eaten by fish, because that happens to the bone. For all the bodies that go on the opposite side of the San Francisco side that aren't found, and, and the families that bury caskets with nobody in them. It's estimated by the Marine Corner that over 2,000 or even higher have died off of this bridge. My name is Kevin Hines and this is my story. Things that things just lined up perfectly. Yeah. And, and even at the hospital, the doctor wasn't supposed to be exactly. there. Exactly. And he was there for a different reason. Uh, yeah. And he opted to do my surgery and save my back. Exactly. Like, you know, it's just everything came into play to help me live. <laughs> oh my God, this is oh, this unbelievable. Is you see it. I told you it's magical how it comes yeah. out of the fog. It's blowing my mind right now. <laughs> you know, this is... <laughs> it would be nice for you to see the bridge underneath it in a more positive light. In the water, after the fall into the water, I, uh, I thought I was hallucinating. I was, uh, right over there. Right over there. I thought I could not have just done that. There's no way I just did that. This is not real. Water's not real. Me going up and down and swallowing salt water is not real. I'm not in this water. I did not jump off that bridge. It didn't happen. And that's when I just prayed. God, please save me. I don't want to die. God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. It was 10 in the morning on September 25th. I think it's about 10 in the morning when I, when I got to the bridge. There was a woman who approached me who I thought was going to ask me if I was OK. Will you take my picture, she said, you know? And I took her picture like five times. She posed, you know? Because she was there to create happy memories. And I was there to die. 
She walked away and I said, nobody, nobody cares. Nobody cares. And I did it. And then the, the last thought before I went over was, jump now. And it wasn't a thought, it was that voice. It was that voice in my head. Jump now. And I did. I was compelled to die. I didn't get on any cord or ledge to be talked back over. I was in free fall. And I, I remember that, that moment of free fall occurring, that second of free fall, and that instant regret. And the thought that it was too late. When I got down there outside of the drum room, we had a board, and it was so the entire team would know what was coming in. There was a little history about the patient, and this is what they had gotten from the paramedics in the field. So I looked at the board, and it said Golden Gate Bridge Jumper, and I was in shock. I hadn't even ever thought of such a thing in my career, and I immediately went into the room, and we helped get ready, and. I heard you coming through the door. You were on the gurney, and I could hear you, so I knew your airway was intact. And you were vocal, and you were basically saying, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. And at that time, I knew that, that you had tremendous remorse. And when you came in, you were extreme pain. You had extremely bad back pain and lower extremity pain. And we were very careful with you. As it turned out, you had a very significant spine injury. But, but the best thing ever was that you were completely intact neurologically. Because your feet hit first, that impact went back up your spine, but fortunately it fractured the lowest part of your spine, which is where your spinal cord ends. So there's more nerves down there rather than actual spinal cord. So really that, again, was the best thing that could have happened to you because you're completely intact. Look at you. you know. Once they got you into uh, uh, out of surgery and into a bedroom, uh, excuse me, a hospital, I didn't leave your side. No, you stayed with me for three weeks or four weeks. The hospital accommodated me, and at first they didn't. No. But that when they, they realized that it was so important to me, they brought in a bed, a cot, and permitted me to uh, stay because um, as I recall, you know, you were, uh, you were out, and I didn't know if uh, you would wake up and, and be a vegetable. He took one step into my room, and I'm laying there all, you know, kind of broken and bent, IVs in both arms. I had a tube coming out of my chest, uh, for, like suctioning out black sludge from, I guess, my lungs or something. Mm -hmm. You know? He walks in and just waterfalls flow from it. I looked up at my dad. I said, Dad, I'm sorry. And he said, no, Kevin, I'm sorry. And both of our immediate reactions for that bridge and what I did there was guilt. He looked so helpless just laying there. Just so, it destroyed me. When we were in high school and he had that first major breakdown and they called me down to the office saying that I needed to go home because my brother, there, something was wrong with my brother. And I went home and he couldn't speak for three days. He sat on the couch and he would start to speak, I feel, uh, uh, and he couldn't speak. And that was, I was terrified, absolutely terrified. Wrestled for three years, freshman year, Sophomore year and senior year. Did my best sophomore year. Why not junior year? Because uh, I was uh, not too well. Great. Oh, wow. Oh, when was the first time you saw me going downhill mentally here at Reardon High School? Well, it, it just seemed like it happened over, overnight because you're, uh, I mean, your freshman year, you were one of our best wrestlers on the team. You were a league champ for, at the freshman level. Uh, sophomore year, you were wrestling varsity for us. We're like, you have the characteristic of a guy that's gonna be a leader for us, that's gonna be a captain. And then your junior year, you come back and it was like a switch flipped. And at first, I thought you just had a different interest. You got more involved with drama. 
And then you started really acting out publicly, which uh, I was the dean at the time too, so I had to deal with that. Yeah. You came up to me and we had this conversation in the hallway and, and you said, hey, I found out what's wrong with me. And you're like, I'm bipolar and I'm gonna get some medication, things are gonna get better. Now I know what's going on. Yeah. And you were happy because you were able to tell me, you know, I'm, I'm not doing something. drugs. I'm not doing drugs. <laughs> so, and a so, lot of people thought that. Yeah. yeah. He's still suffering from bipolar. This, this chump didn't take that out of his system. All it did was, you know, crush his vertebrae and break his ankle. The other day, um, I walked into a room of 5,000 people. I'm in the back, thinking that all of these 5,000 people, they're all here to kill me. And they're gonna choose by the end of the speech which one is gonna end me, and they're gonna do it while I'm on stage. And my mind just went, well, you know, they'll get a good message before I die. It's not, it's not like this all the time. But like the, like you see the bullhorns over there, they're, everything is dangerous. Everyone is out to get you. Everything can hurt you. It's just part of the deal, man. His mental health issues and brain health issues and suic chronic suicidality are real and he actually goes through something, whether it's mania or depression or paranoia or suicidal ideation, something every day, there's something. But because he is taking care of his wellness, he manages it so well, he has a support system, me, our friends, our family, and he knows that he's always in a safe place. He's able to come out of that paranoid situation, depressive situation, much quicker than a lot of people that have his diagnosis. What the hell? Okay, that's enough. What's it been like loving someone unconditionally with bipolar disorder? Who says it's unconditional? Oh, okay. <laughs> we hit it off, you know, and I looked into your eyes and I knew this would be my life. Um, I knew you would be the rest of my life. I didn't know that. Well, you didn't know that because you, you, you're blind. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you, you That's the hero. I mean, Kevin, Margie lives with Kevin every day. And Margie is very bright. And I think that Margie needs to get an awful lot of credit for Kevin's successes because the bipolar hasn't gone away. Margie lives with it every day and Margie's managed to encapsulate it so that Kevin can function. Nine years married, 11 years together. Uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, she's my rock and my savior. And I, will, I tell you this part of the story so you can see that no matter the pain you're going in and having today or the people you love are going through today, they can have a better tomorrow. Hey, brother. Hello, Kevin. How you doing? Welcome. Oh, thank you. Welcome. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. You're looking good. I feel good. You look a lot thinner than the last <laughs> time I saw you. I am. I was a little heavy. No, you were fat. <laughs> and my kids thought I was crazy when I said I'm joining the Franciscans. They said, well, well, we'd like to take you to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I said, no, you're not. Well, why would you leave this job at Bank of America? I had a good position at the bank. Why would you leave this to, to go join them? And I said, because it's something I want to do with the rest of my life, whatever may be left of it, to do something that really could make a difference no matter how small it is. And so they didn't try to commit me. <laughs> you were the first person and a consistent person to ever say, you know, Kevin, you should talk about this. And I remember when you first said it, um, I, th I thought, what? What does he mean, talk about this? I, I, 
we're talking right now, <laughs> but, but you meant to, to make an impact on, yes. on people's lives. And I will say you've gotten better at making that speech, but. <laughs> and today I travel the globe spreading a message of hope. Why? Because we know it helps people heal. colleges all around the country and the globe, and I see people who say, my friend told me what he was thinking, but then he said, don't tell anyone, and I didn't tell anyone. And now that individual at such a young age is going to regret that for the rest of their lives, because the next thing they realized was that individual had passed on. In suicide prevention, you're trained not to, not to get angry at someone who does this, who dies by their own hands. And I attempted, and I caused, I caused so much rage in people that love me dearly. And it's, it's understandable. It's a natural reaction. But, you know, even, even very rarely today, I'll have a Mr. Fennell dream. But for the first few dreams, I could never see his face. It was always a profile or the back of his head. And you always recognize the back of his head by this goofy haircut, you know? Right. <laughs> and, and then every time I was in a, in a shopping center or, 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 at, or, at a, or at, you know, Safeway or whatever, and I would see someone with that kind of haircut, I'd jump forward and I'd want to say, Mr. Fennell! And then I'd, just, I'd stop myself, mm -hmm. you know? Father Tim was our principal at the time, yeah. and we were celebrating our 50th, anniversary so we had this big party in the gymnasium and we had all these alumni and right afterward we get together he goes hey I need to talk to you and he pulls our whole team together and he's all choked up in tears I thought it was because uh, of the the great evening we had he said I don't want to say anything but John Fennell killed himself he did that I found out uh, this morning you know, and we didn't have social media back then. No, so, that's right. So it gave us some time to sit down and have a plan of how we were going to tell students, you know, because uh, we wanted everyone to find out at the same time. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, one of the ideas, you bring everybody into the theater. And we're like, no, that's crazy. <laughs> that's so, a terrible idea. And it was tough because the kids in the play and people like you really looked up to him, but we didn't want to glorify no, no. what happened. If a father dies by suicide and his son is two, and the son at two doesn't know what happened, but he gets to be 12, and that's when mom decides, oh, I can tell my son what happened to his father. Then that son regrieves the father he lost all over again, but now knowing it's a suicide and he didn't just die from an accident. And that son goes on to have emotions and feelings and pain and suffering, maybe depression, and then they have kids. And somebody they tell their kids, it just goes on forever. You know, one person goes to this bridge to die every seven to 10 days. And if you thought of any other two mile stretch of land around the world, land, a street, a road, that had this many deaths, that road would be shut down. Mm -hmm. The atrocities would stop. And when we realize, I think, that these people, they're not going there to, to die in front of a beautiful bridge. They're going there because of a four-foot rail, it's because it's easy. I think it's our obligation to stop it. And now, please welcome to the stage, Kana Inamoto, 
Principal Deputy Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. I've had the chance to share the stage with Kevin before, and what I appreciate about him so much is his gift, his gift of telling his story. Not only does he have an amazing experience and an amazing spirit, an amazing power as an individual, an amazing will uh, to live and to survive, but he has gone on to do so much to share his gift with others, to foster recovery for other people. He is one in a million. But at the same time, though he may seem an outlier, Kevin joins many other people. The story of a 19-year-old young man just waiting for someone to hold out their hand and say, how are you? The story of a young man feeling like nobody loves them, nobody cares about them, that he has no hope, that he needs to die. Kevin was not alone in that. We are not alone in that. Well, I certainly hope you enjoyed that sneak peek of Suicide, the Ripple Effect, a film ultimately about hope, healing, and recovery. Remember, if you want to own this film on iTunes, click the link in description and pre-order your copy now. It will be yours to own on May 30th. And please remember this, you are worthy, you do matter, you're important to me and my entire team. And as I always say, be here tomorrow and every single day after that.